We heard from Ted last night that, uh, that, mat that material well-being is a necessary but insufficient condition for democracy. I want to focus on that material well-being part of the equation, food, water, health, energy, all of these things that humanity relies on from the physical and biological world. And the main point I'd like to make is that the worldview that has underpinned the progress that uh, Steve spoke about, I think is unlike the worldview that we need to underpin uh, progress in the future. We've seen the great statistics about improvements in health and wealth and all of that data is undeniable. The drop in um, the numbers proportion of the population in abject poverty is probably the greatest achievement of humankind. But I would argue that that last 10% is fundamentally different than the first 90%. So if we look back at the 20th century and all of those achievements, it was about more. And more is not necessarily bad, but it was about more food, more energy, more science, more knowledge, more stuff. And technologies focused on um, producing more, and that's what pulled people out of poverty. And this seems to be an emergent property of our species that the cumulative knowledge that we've built up over many, many, many millennia seems to always find ways to produce more. So that's one emergent property. But a second emergent property seems to be that there's punctuated changes in our worldview about how to produce more. And that's often propelled by the reality or the perception that less is uh, facing us in the future at least less for those in a position of power to do something about it. For example, coal combustion, which was motivated by the depletion of trees for fuel wood, or synthesis of fixed nitrogen, which was at least partially motivated by the depletion of guano. And these punctuated changes led to entirely new ways of manipulating nature and extracting resources and moving on to produce more. And the 20th century showed that the prophecies of less are most likely destined to the pile of unfulfilled predictions. And there's no reason to think why this emergent property of our species shouldn't continue to figure out how to produce more. But let's think about the other emergent property, the step changes in worldviews that underlie these technologies. A key feature of eco-modernism, at least the way I think about eco-modernism, is that more is needed, but more is not enough for progress in the future. Better technologies to reduce pressure on nature and to decarbonize societies in which people live happy and fulfilling lives and not just be counted in the column of not poor. Take food as an example. The 20th century was clearly about more, and the world is now very awash in calories. And the world is also awash in malnourished people, two to three billion of them. Less than one billion people are undernourished without access to enough calories, and two billion are overnourished with too many. And the latter is rising while the former is dropping. And an estimated two billion, that's 30% of the population, are deficient in some micronutrient, iron or, or some other nutrient, while consuming sufficient calories. So clearly, the answer to feeding the world is not just about more as much as the technologists who know how to produce more would like us to think. It's access and opportunities that will allow the bottom 10% to partake in the abundance of more, and a whole restructuring in the way decisions are made about what farmers grow and what people have access to buy, a whole food systems kind of look at this system. Um, a second example of this punctuated point that we face in society is about wildlands and nature. We saw the, the statistics from Steve about the incredible increase in the land and, and marine area under protection over the last couple of decades, and that is all fantastic. But that is also about more. And I would argue that more is not likely to be the path to future progress in protecting wildlands and nature. Besides the obvious point that land is in strong competition, uh, or that protected areas are in strong competition with agriculture and other kinds of uses, it's clear that 
Purely area under protection is just one of many requirements to save nature. Protected areas can only function for large ranging species if they are connected through corridors. Protected areas coincide in space with where the world's poorest people live. So there will always be conflict between conservation and local people unless people don't depend on the same resources for water and energy and so on. So this again is a whole systems view. A final example, and I'm stepping way outside of my expertise here, so I probably shouldn't go here, but I will. <laughs> One of the greatest public health achievements of the 20th century was the eradication of um, smallpox, and that was a fantastic achievement with the hard work and dedication and smarts of many, many people. So not to underplay this great achievement, but in the realm of the ecology of infectious disease, smallpox was a relatively simple problem. Only humans can host the virus, symptoms appear quickly, effective vaccines are available, all sorts of reasons why this was a relatively simple problem. Other diseases, Lyme, Zika, Nipah virus, SARS, Ebola, and so on, have much more complex ecologies with non-human hosts and lag times that do not fit the same mold as the smallpox. And no other infectious disease has been eradicated since smallpox, despite the enthusiasm of the public health community after that, uh, that achievement was, was made. So again, future progress on infectious disease and health needs different models. So if we look at these two emergent properties of human civilization, accumulated knowledge to produce more and punctuated changes in worldviews about how to make progress, it seems that we are certainly at the second, which coincides with um, Nils' remarks. I'm not sure exactly what this worldview is, but it's not just about different technologies to produce more protected areas, more food, or more vaccines, the same way we've done in the past. It's a worldview that builds on the sum of the parts rather than the parts of the sum. And that's a different way of thinking about the world. So here's a very lovely piece of art by um, Kandinsky. So it makes us feel happy, right? We see the critters, the jellyfish, the rocking horse, the turtles. It has a mood, creates a mood. We feel happy when we look at this. But if we think about this, the elements of this picture and break it down into its parts, which is what this artist does, you take the elements and then you can categorize them by color, you can sort them by size. So this is the same elements. It doesn't have the same mood. It doesn't make us happy. So this is the worldview that we've been following in the 20th century to, to, to make more. We stack things up, we categorize them, we, we stack them high and we stack them very, very high. But we have no mood. So what we need in the future, I think, is stepping backwards and thinking about what kind of artwork do we want to create? And then how do we assemble the pieces to, uh, to get to that end point? So that's a fundamentally different way of looking at the world. And E.O. Wilson, as many others, were onto this way of thinking a long time ago. And I certainly don't agree with everything that E.O. Wilson says, but he is a very wise man. And one of the things that he said a, a while back in his wonderful book, Consilience, is that scientists have broken down many kinds of systems. They think they know most of the elements and forces. The next task is to reassemble them to capture the key properties of entire ensembles. So I think our, our pathway to progress in the future is thinking about our worldview, thinking about what we want the picture to look like, and then working towards assembling the pieces rather than the other way around. Thank you.